Welcome to the 700 Club. Blowback against the White House for colluding with Facebook to flag posts they claim promote misinformation about COVID. Critics are crying government overreach and suppression of freedom of speech. Meanwhile, COVID is spiking again in nearly every state. Our George Thomas has the story. The White House facing backlash after calling on social media companies to flag what they consider misinformation about COVID-19. This as cases of the virus in nearly every state are on the rise. The nation is averaging 25,300 new cases each day, more than double that of a few weeks ago, but far below the worst of the pandemic. Now is our moment to really double down on our vaccination efforts and our other prevention interventions. Los Angeles County, the largest in the nation, is now reinstating its indoor mask mandate. We will be implementing an order requiring masking indoors, regardless of vaccination. 160 million Americans are fully vaccinated, and so so far, the vaccines are proving effective against the Delta variant. Health officials say the majority of people getting sick are not vaccinated, and the White House blames what it calls misinformation circulating on social media. Today, I issued a Surgeon General's advisory on the dangers of health misinformation. Two-thirds of people not vaccinated, he says, believe common myths. Myths like you can get COVID from the vaccine, which is absolutely not true. Now, Press Secretary Jen Psaki says the White House is in regular contact with Facebook about flagging posts seen as problematic. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook uh, that spread disinformation. And asking the social media giant to step up enforcement. There's about 12 people who are producing 65 percent of anti-vaccine misinformation on social media platforms. All of them remain active on Facebook. Critics slammed the move, saying it infringes on the First Amendment, pointing out experts have frequently been wrong, like the theory COVID started in a Chinese lab, once banned from some online discussions, but now considered credible even by the World Health Organization. As you know, I was uh, a lab technician myself. I'm an immunologist, and I have worked in the lab, and lab accidents happen. It's common. I have seen it happening. Conservative commentator Katie Pavlich tweeted, reminder, Fauci worked with Facebook to ban the lab leak theory, which is factual for more than a year. Journalist Glenn Greenwald tweeted, this is the union of corporate and state power, one of the classic hallmarks of fascism that the people who spent five years babbling about fascism support. The White House says it's careful not to politicize the vaccine, but critics argue their latest move is another expansion of government power, this time over free speech. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. In other news, a new technology might help stop a future pandemic. It's a tiny sensor, and guess where it sits? Right under your skin. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. That is right, Wendy. The tiny hydrogel sensor was originally developed to help treat diabetes, but for the Department of Defense, it's a way to stop the spread of infection dead in its tracks. CBN's national security correspondent, Caitlin Burke, has the story. Investment in this kind of technology has been going on for years, all with one goal, to protect the soldiers protecting us. What we do is we say, well, the science is interesting, but we're translating that. We're translating that into application and benefit. And um, it's something, frankly, I think the Department of Defense does really, really well. We can see science, but we say we have mission. We have, we have a national security mission. In March of 2020, the USS Theodore Roosevelt made headlines when more than 1,000 sailors on board tested positive for COVID-19. For two months, the outbreak kept the ship and its crew of 4,800 sailors from their mission of defending our nation. Dr. Matthew Hepburn says he's devoted his entire career to prevent that from ever happening again. What we want to do is detect an infection as early as possible uh, before someone even spreads it to another person to try to prevent that infection in the first place so that it never happens. But if it does, we detect and treat 
And what we also might want to do is then make sure everybody else is protected. That dream now appears possible thanks to this tiny hydrogel biosensor. Placed under the skin, it measures what's going on at a tissue level. For example, the amount of lactate in your body. The level of lactate at the tissue level um, is a really good indicator um, that someone is starting to get sick. It's one of those things that we see go up pretty early in severe infection um, called sepsis. The sensor doesn't identify what infection you might have. It's more of an alert. Hepburn compares it to a check engine light. Like a check engine light doesn't say there, there, there's a problem, you're out of oil or something like that. It just says there's something wrong. There may be something wrong with your engine, so take a closer look. So the idea of the sensor is check engine light goes off, then you need to do some more specific tests to figure out if you have COVID or something else wrong with you. This next generation technology was invented by Perfusa. The private sector company created it to help treat diabetes. Now, through a partnership with the Department of Defense, the sensor has been developed for a number of other purposes. Besides detecting infection, it can also measure oxygen levels. So you can think of like a pilot. You'd want to know tissue level hypoxia or low oxygen as, a, as an early signal that you're not getting enough oxygen to your tissues. Currently in clinical trials, this, like all other vaccines and treatments provided by the Department of Defense, must get FDA approval. This one appears to be well on its way to that achievement. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Technological breakthroughs. Thanks, Caitlin. Well, people of faith around the world are targeted daily from violent attacks to so-called polite persecution, putting limits on how they can express their faith. But as Jennifer Wishon reports, a growing number of people are joining forces to stop it. Most people in the world, 80 percent, live in countries where their religious activity is restricted by their government, and increasingly that persecution is severe. This week, people from across the globe representing 30 different faith traditions are gathering here in Washington to promote religious freedom. Please keep praying for my brother. Thank you so much. Some came to advocate for loved ones. Survivors told their stories. Persecution is very hard. Miriam Ibrahim made headlines when she refused to recant her Christian faith despite a death sentence in Sudan. It's choice that, you know, and because we are the Christian, we know our freedom is in Jesus. Tursurne Zayawudin is a Uyghur Muslim who managed to escape from a concentration camp in China. Her pain is palpable. She and other women were regularly raped, subjected to electric shock, and humiliated for the crime of their faith. Now she can't escape thoughts of her people continuing to suffer. Sometimes I think it, it would be better if I were back in the homeland with them, even if it meant death. I'm so shocked that the world is just sitting by and watching. The Chinese government is, has absolutely no shame about this. The type of surveillance the Chinese communist regime uses against Uyghurs has been exported to more than 80 countries. That means that the government in those uh, dystopian uh, uh, regimes, uh, the bad actors, can use that technology to monitor who's going to what church, uh, saying what in, during the sermon. Despite growing awareness of global persecution, sometimes not even genocide garners enough aid or attention. Seven years after ISIS nearly wiped out Iraq's Yazidi community, much of their homeland remains uninhabitable. There's people dying of hunger and thirst, and it's like, People, like I said, offer sympathy, but it's like at, at the end of the day, I was just exhausted and my family and people were still suffering, dying of lack of medical aid and thirst and hunger. For the Hungarian government, helping persecuted Christians is a moral obligation. Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. Tristan Asbe serves as state secretary for Christian aid. In four years, Hungary has supported a quarter million persecuted Christians, helped reconstruct 67 churches in Lebanon, and rebuilt the Christian town of Teleskuf, Iraq, after it was decimated by ISIS. 900 buildings were damaged. Uh, the church there was uh, used for target uh, practice by the jihadists. 
No matter their motivation, religious freedom advocates agree they receive much more than they give. They have a message to keep our identity, to keep our faith in, in, in Christ. There's no downside to religious freedom. Countries that practice tolerance enjoy greater stability and prosperity. Jennifer Wish on CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer, for shining the light on such an incredibly important issue. Wendy? Absolutely. Thanks, John. And of course, the Bible says in Hebrews to remember those in prison and those being mistreated. So let's all remember to pray for persecuted believers around the world. Movie makers, archaeologists, and even the Queen of England all have been fascinated by the search for the Ark of the Covenant. Some legends claim the Ark is as far away as Ethiopia or Ireland. But one explorer believes it lies behind a giant rock at Judaism's holiest site. Why is he so convinced? Chris Mitchell explains. Researcher and author Harry Moskov took CBN News through the Western Wall tunnels up to the ramparts of the Temple Mount and into the chambers surrounding Judaism's holiest site. His book, The Ark Report, chronicles his two-decade quest to find the legendary icon. So here we are approaching the three arches. He says one theory is that it was taken out of the temple and carried to Jericho 18 miles away. It says in uh, Jeremiah that some of the vessels of the temple were exited, uh, sort of escaped as it were, through this area at the destruction of the first temple. But Moskov took us to the spot where he believes the Ark lies. This particular section of the Western Wall is really fascinating actually because this stone is 570 mm -hmm. tons. Moscow believes a key clue lies behind this giant rock and says high-tech search tools give credence to his theory. There were tests done by the University of Nebraska, sonar tests, etc., uh, using electromagnetic uh, waves. They actually found what's called a storage space across from here. So actually, the, there was a purpose for putting this giant stone this massive uh, slab here, one of the reasons, in my opinion, is to protect whatever it is on the other side. And according to my theory of the Ark actually was buried by King Josea, I think it was uh, 568 BC, in back of these uh, boulders, these massive stones. In fact, underneath the Temple Mount lie dozens of underground tunnels and chambers. Back then, 150 years ago, Charles Warren went in, actually did a survey. Nothing's really been done for political purposes, obviously, unfortunately. Since no, then? Since then, no one's been allowed to even put a shovel, nothing. Yeah. But uh, basically, they were the ones that surveyed the whole area, and they were the ones who picked out the tunnels, etc. Yeah. They couldn't find the ark, but... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it wasn't time. Warren, a British explorer, documented those tunnels at the request of Queen Victoria just one of many throughout history looking for the Ark. When people like the Crusaders and the Knights Templar, even the uh, Palestine Exploration Fund, which was originally commissioned by Queen Victoria, came over the centuries to look for the Ark. What they were looking for was a golden box with the staves, but what they, what they really should be looking for is a room. They could have been right up against the wall, and on the other side of the wall is the Ark. Moscow says the original Holy of Holies had another chamber directly below it. Actually, in the blueprint itself of the first temple, a chamber should be built exactly the same, a holy of holies, exactly the same level of holiness as the one right above it. It was set up right from the beginning mm. to house the ark with a golden floor and everything. That's how Solomon built it, instructed, so this, the ark itself could go down. Right, it could go down. Do you feel right. like there's a time when the ark itself, when the time is right, will be revealed? I do. Timing is incredibly important, incredibly significant. Obviously, it's a, it's a groundbreaking, game-changing, <laughs> biblical type of discovery. My personal opinion is that uh, when it does happen, it won't be in a clandestine way where we're sneaking through these tunnels, you know what I mean, and we're bringing it out uh, under cover of darkness. It'll be a great occasion and it'll help bring the Messiah. It'll be something that all nations will, will really rejoice in. Moscow credits Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark for the renewed interest. There are some things that got right about the, you know, the power of the Ark, etc., and its destructive forces should get in the wrong hands and it knows where it is, so to speak. It suddenly became a thing, 
you know, oh, what is the Ark of the Covenant? You know, what is that? Oh, yeah, and sort of put it into the face of the public. And maybe that was its best success. Yeah. I loved it personally, you know, it's Hollywood. What do you think is the main takeaway people need to know about the Ark of the Covenant? It's a real thing, just like it did 2,700 years ago. It still exists today. It's got the broken tablets that Moses uh, crashed down there at Mount Sinai and the second tablets. It really does exist. We're really going to see it, hopefully, in our lifetime uh, again. It is a catalyst for the Messiah to come. Until it is revealed, the Ark of the Covenant built by Moses in the wilderness will continue to fascinate the world. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Western Wall Tunnels, Jerusalem. One thing's for sure, God knows exactly where it is, and in His perfect timing, all will be revealed. What a day that will be. Well, at CBN, we are committed to blessing the nation of Israel, and one of the most important ways we can do that is through prayer. Psalm 122.6 reminds us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And in this free guide, 10 ways you can pray for Israel, you'll learn spiritual lessons from Israel's patriarchs, prophets, and New Testament leaders. You'll also discover specific ways to pray for Israel today. So to get your free copy, just call us 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to cbn.com slash pray for Israel to get your free copy, 10 ways you can pray for Israel. Her life was flashing before her eyes and getting a glimpse of her own funeral. Terminal cancer stalked Abigail every waking moment. You will die from this. That's what her doctor told her. So why is Abigail still alive to tell her story and completely cancer free? You're about to find out. I had those moments waking up just in a cold sweat, knowing that the Grim Reaper was standing at the foot of my bed. Like, I have a right to be here. I took your dad out, took a grandparent. I never even knew my grandparents. I have a right. I'm here to get you too. All her life, Abigail Holt Jennings had braced herself for this moment, a battle with cancer. She'd watched her dad fight it for 10 years until he passed away when she was 16. Now 42 years old, she'd been diagnosed with an aggressive form of metastatic cancer. I think the Lord was preparing me like, you're about to enter a battle, but I am with you. Less than a year earlier, she'd undergone a double mastectomy after learning she had stage three breast cancer. She thought she was in the clear, but six months later at a follow-up PET scan with her oncologist. He said, this is what I feared. It's moving to your lungs and you see these places? He's like, these are places I cannot get to. This is, this is terminal and you will die from this. The treatments he did offer were extreme and would only put off the inevitable. That is when that grim reaper, I could feel, I could feel that thing, that spirit of death and that spirit of fear walk in the room. And then I felt wonderful Jesus walk in the room as well. <laughs> and he said, but who do you say that I am? And it was in that moment that something rose up inside of me. And I remember answering him in my mind. This is gonna be a great line in my book one day. In other words, I know you're gonna heal me and I'm gonna write about this one day. Abigail declined the treatments and decided she would fight cancer taking a natural and dietary approach and above all, praying and believing God for healing. As believers, there is a, a hope inside of us. And so now, did, did I just walk around like, oh, you know, I didn't know how God was gonna do it but I knew my eyes were on him. Enlisting the prayers of her family and friends, Abigail, a single mom of two, talked openly with her children about her health. And I remember my little girl, Lily, came up to me with a magazine and she opened the magazine and she loved American Girl dolls. They now have a, an American Girl doll with no hair. And she said, mom, maybe I need to get this one this year in case you lose your hair. And I said, honey, you will not have to order that doll because mommy is not losing her hair. Three months later, another PET scan showed the cancer was spreading aggressively in her lymph nodes. Holding on to hope was becoming harder. I simply had no options. I was just getting more scared and more frustrated and would wake up with dreams, seeing like a movie screen, my funeral, then, a couple months after getting that news, 
Abigail went to the Dominican Republic to visit a friend, a doctor, and take time to rest and see God. Abigail remembers showing her friend the PET scan results. The look on her face when she read that last one, and I had never seen her look like that. That did rattle me. All I know to do is seek God with all my heart. That's all I know to do. She would spend many hours that week in prayer, seeking God's will. Late one night, near the end of her visit. I got out there and I said, God, I need to know, am I gonna die? What do you have to say about this? It was just me and God. That is when I felt Jesus walk in, if you will, and I felt his presence. He said, uh, Abigail, I came to have a conversation with you. I came to actually go on a walk. Abigail says she then saw a vision of herself with Jesus in Jerusalem. He walked her past the cross and into the tomb where he lay down. And he said, watch this. And he sat up and he said, Abigail, when I sat up, you sat up. And then he walked to the entrance of the tomb and I will never forget this as long as I live. He said, when I walked out of the tomb, did I have cancer in my lungs? I said, no, Jesus, you didn't. He said, so do you have to have cancer in your lungs? I said, no, Jesus, I don't. And in that moment, I knew I am cancer free. A few weeks after she came home, Abigail faced yet another PET scan. She says that morning, Jesus spoke to her again. Good morning. This is the glory scan. <laughs> and I went, I went in that tube. You know, I hate those things. And I just sang, not a fear, not nothing. Later that day, a nurse called with the results. And she goes, Abigail, I, I don't really know what to say, but uh, there's nothing here. Like, there's, there's nothing here. And I was like, I know. I know! <laughs> At the follow-up appointment, her oncologist confirmed that Abigail was cancer-free. He goes, I don't need my degree on my wall to see that this is a miracle. That was 2017, and Abigail has been cancer-free ever since. To anyone who's fighting a battle, her message is clear. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He was trying to tell me, this doesn't have to do with you, I took care of sin at the cross. I took care of every disease. I took care of every sickness. He is entirely the healer, entirely. I love Abigail's story so much because she had a choice to believe the grim reaper who said, you're gonna die from this. And even her doctor said, you're gonna die from this. Or to believe the spirit of Jesus Christ, the healer who said, whose report are you gonna believe? Did I have lung cancer when I came out of the grave? No. And she chose to believe that she was healed according to the word of God, which says, I have forgiven all of your sins and healed all of your diseases. You know, there's somebody today and you need this story so much because you've had that bad report and you're believing that lie. I remember myself 20 years ago, I. Had, I got diagnosed with melanoma and they'd already cut it out of my arm and a place on my leg and I was recovering and I really didn't even understand uh, how serious melanoma could be. And I'm laying in bed and I hear cancer and I knew that I knew that was the voice of the enemy telling, trying to get me to own it, trying to get me to think I have cancer. Let me tell you what happened. I got out of that bed and I told that enemy where to go and that I would never again get cancer in the name of Jesus, never again. You have to get in the enemy's face and tell him, I am a child of God. This is not my inheritance. This is not what God has for me. And like Abigail, she was a fighter. Man, I just love her testimony so much because it was a grim diagnosis. She felt the grim reaper in her room, but Jesus said, you are healed. So today, believe, choose today who are you going to believe because God wants to heal you. He went, he went to the cross so you could be healed. Receive it today. Believe the truth today. 
And also, uh, we have a praise report from Barry from Rogersville, Tennessee, was told that the results of a CAT scan showed cancer throughout his liver. Before another day went by, Barry called us at CBN's prayer line to agree for complete healing. Then he went in for a biopsy. Just as the needle was about to go in, the doctor asked Barry if he was the same person who was in, in the other day. And the doctor was amazed because there was no sign of cancer. Praise Jesus. Jesus wants to wipe it out completely. He doesn't heal you halfway. He wants to wipe it out completely. So let's pray really quick today. I know there's so many of you right now just needing that healing touch, needing that miracle. So Lord, we thank you that you are the God of miracles. What you did for Abigail, what you did for Barry, God, you're no respecter of persons. Lord, uh, I pray right now for that miracle healing virtue to touch every viewer who's watching, everyone who's raising their hands right now and saying, that's me, that's what I need. And Lord, that their next doctor's visit, God, they're gonna get that clean slate, that clean report. God, I believe with them, Lord, for that miracle. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. At least 110 people have died in devastating floods across parts of Western Germany and Belgium as rescue crews and operations and searches continue for hundreds of missing people. Germany's president said he's stunned by the devastation and pledged to support, uh, pledged support rather, for the families of those who have been killed. Along those lines, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping people facing disasters around the world. Six-year-old Masani lives in an area of Kenya hit by severe drought. Her mother is a farm worker and has struggled to provide for her children. With little water and sometimes nothing to eat, Masani would complain of stomach and head pain so bad she thought she would die. She prayed to God to send them food, and thanks to Operation Blessing's partners, Masani and her family enrolled in an Operation Blessing school nearby. She now gets free education and two meals a day with access to a water system built near the school. And her mother joined the OB Agriculture Program, helping to provide for her family. They both thank God and OB's partners for their help. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting OB.org. Wendy will be back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Fame, fortune, devoted fans, actress Brenda Epperson had them all. So why wasn't it never enough? For three decades, Brenda Epperson Moore captured the hearts of her fans as a singer, author, and film and television actress. She's best known for her recurring role as Ashley Abbott on the popular soap opera, The Young and the Restless. But Brenda's journey to fortune and success was filled with setbacks and losses. Yet this courageous, unstoppable woman would not give up on her dreams. She tells her personal story of overcoming disappointment and discovering joy in her new book, Rise Up. And welcome back to the 700 Club, my friend, Brenda <laughs> Everson Moore. Hey, Brenda, great to see you. Hi, good morning. It's so good to see you too, Wendy. I adore you. Thank Likewise. you for having me on. Absolutely. Well, Thank Brenda, you. you landed the prime role on the hottest soap with virtually no acting <gasps> experience. How did you yes. do that? That was a miracle. Honestly, it was a miracle number, you know, 3,000 in my life. I'll tell you, I moved to Los Angeles from um, Oregon to sing because I'm a singer. And um, I ran into a girl who plays part on The Young and the Restless and everybody said, oh, you look just like her. <laughs> and um, when I saw her, she goes, you should audition for the part. And I went, sure. <laughs> so I thought, let me just call the office. I started calling the casting office. One thing led to another, started going in on auditions and got a screen test. And God just opened those doors. You know, he purposed for me to be there yeah. at that studio and on that show for sure. Yeah. It was a miracle. You, well, you were a natural, <laughs> a natural born actor. Actress. Thank you. So <laughs> why was fame, though, and fortune not enough for you? I mean, you had it all. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, what I talk about in my book, Rise Up, I talk about so many things. And, you know, God really called me to ignite his people when I wrote this book. And I'm so passionate about people understanding the purpose and the calling on their life. And this book is for anyone who's been afraid or abused or hurt or lonely or 
touch darkness like me. And yeah. at the end of each each chapter, I give you challenge questions that will help you uncover those limited mindsets and thinking that are holding you back. Because when I was on the show, what the world has to offer is temporal, but what God has to offer, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, is eternal. We will never be able to find our purpose or our passion in the world. We have to plug in to Christ. Yeah. And, you know, being on the show and being on the set was wonderful and it taught me so much, but then it became a very toxic environment, Wendy, and it was very clear to me that I needed to go. And God opened another door for me. I signed with Sony TriStar Music and I was able to open for Lionel Richie all over Europe. And even on the set of the Young and the Restless and being at CBS, I led a cast member to Christ and, and prayed for people. So God used me at that platform. But when, when he puts us in places and pivotally puts us these places, sometimes it's for a long time, but often it's a season yeah. and that season was over. So it's up to us to know when God is moving us on to the next thing. Well, before you ever became Ashley Abbott, uh, you, you're, you were so, um, you had a great relationship with your father. You adored him. And he died yeah. at, when you were very young. And then you actually were raped by a, a little boy when you were only, uh, what, six years old? Was it six yeah. years old? And Seven, yeah. Seven. And um, I know all these things, you know, affected you so much. And But your mom was a devoted Christian. Why did you rebel yeah. against God when you were young? Well, you know, um, you know, again, I talk about in my book, Rise Up, how, you know, and I love CBN, by the way. If you're not a partner at CBN, I just tell you to be a partner because every blessing that CBN does to, and gives to so many people, that's your blessing, too. And I'm so passionate about CBN and, and all that you guys do. Thank you so much. You prayed one time, um, and my mother was healed. <laughs> so, you know, God does great things through CBN, Wendy, and everybody there. You know, um, Thank you. when— my yes, when my father died, I um, my life and my world was turned upside down. We had no money, um, no life insurance policy, and we lost our home where we lived. Uh, you know, we moved out of the state and we lived with my aunt. And um, I was also carrying a deep, dark secret of being raped as a young girl. And my innocence was taken away. My youth was stolen. And I was so angry with God because I didn't understand as a young girl holding that secret that when I said, I hate you, God, that I opened the door for that hate and that anger and that unforgiveness to penetrate into my soul. And I began to um, hate myself and, and Brenda, um, because when did you finally, you know, su surrender to Jesus? Because you were going through so much. Oh. I was going through so much and I just hated myself and the world was telling me I was ugly, I was abused, I was abandoned, I would never measure up. And then at a candlelit service, um, I was standing there and I felt the love of Christ and a warmth over my body. Like that woman said in the story earlier, then Jesus walked in yeah. <laughs> and her life was transformed and she was healed. And my soul was healed from that hate and that anger and the abuse and all of the ugliness melted away and I accepted it into my heart. And that's when my life changed in a moment. And that's what God can do for, for everybody. And that's what I talk about, the emotional healing that I underwent and the practical daily steps that I give people in my book, Rise Up, that they can take to overcome those, those limited mindsets and bondages that are holding you back and move you and propel you forward into the future and the calling and the Amen. hope and the life of freedom that God has for each one of us. Amen. Well, you know, I've got several copies. I've been giving it away. I love this book and I want everyone to read it. Brenda's book, again, it's called Rise Up. It's available, available wherever books are sold. Get your copy. Yes. It's a great read for this summer uh, while you're on the beach. You will absolutely love it. Brenda, thank you so much. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Well, wildfires are currently ravaging the Pacific Northwest, and Brenda knows exactly what it's like to be in the path of a raging inferno. In 2018, the roaring flames leaped up to the fence of her family's property in Southern California. So what happened next?
nothing short of a miracle. Hollywood actress, singer, and co-founder of Ascend Women, Brenda Epperson, has been following Jesus most of her life. But her faith took a turn. Not long after she and her husband moved their three daughters into their California home. When we first moved in, I remember this sense of, you gotta pray over this property, you gotta pray over the land, you gotta pray over the horses, you gotta pray over every inch. This was the perfect home for their family, a beautiful location in the Agora Hills with land and stables for their daughter's horses. But from the day they moved in, Brenda felt an inexplicable urge to pray that would go on for a year and a half. I would find myself waking up and just walking around the property, standing up on the hills behind me, crying out to God, falling on my knees, declaring His love and His promises and professing that this property was a safe haven, this property would be a beacon of light. Brenda not only prayed, she felt inspired to write scripture on wooden stakes and put them around the property. I'm pounding stakes in the ground, declaring God's favor, declaring Psalms 91, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against this land of us, you know. And I just thought, I'm insane. What is going on? But I felt so compelled to just speak life over death. Then came a morning when she woke with an unshakable heaviness in her heart. I said, Lord, what is this heaviness that I feel? I went to go get my kids, and there it was, a plume of smoke. And all of a sudden, I went, <gasps> something's wrong. A trio of wind-driven fires exploding in California. On November 8, 2018, one of the three destructive fires to hit California, the Wolsey Fire, began to consume Los Angeles and Ventura counties, taking lives and hundreds of homes in its wake. Obliterating entire neighborhoods. I turned on the news and the loss and the devastation and the people's homes being burned and the land that was being swallowed up by fire. I knew this was bad. Right then, Brenda received a frantic call from a friend whose home was in direct line of the fire and desperately needed a safe place to evacuate her family and animals. I said, honey, we've got to go get our friends. So we grabbed the trailer, the truck, and then I grabbed my truck. After turning their home into a shelter, the Eppersons began settling everyone in when a nearby boarding stable called, looking to relocate their 35 horses upon evacuation. And I, I took a deep breath and I thought, okay, God, this is happening. That night, Brenda couldn't sleep. She hadn't noticed the boarding stable had already brought the horses and left. Then it dawned on her. And I'm going, oh my gosh, they've evacuated. Stirring up the house in preparation to leave, she and her friend immediately drove to the gas station to make sure they had a full tank in their trucks. It's dark, there's only one light on in the gas station. Thank God they left the gas station on. And I hear the police driving, evacuate, everybody now evacuate over the bullhorn. And it's just apocalyptic, like the end of the world. So we get back to the house and we looked at each other and I said, we've got to go. I can either pray or panic. I can either be in faith or in fear. And I chose prayer and faith. And I said, Lord, even if everything goes, I'm still going to give you glory. I'm still going to trust you. After cramming three horses and as many other animals as they could into their trucks and trailer, they hosed the area around the remaining horses and fled to Malibu. But they had to evacuate again. Eventually, they found safety at a friend's house in Burbank. We turn on the news and the hills around our home are on fire now. And I said, you know what? We're gonna turn the TV off and we're gonna trust God. After a couple days, Brenda and her husband decided to venture home. They passed through a police point and went on to their neighborhood. It was apocalyptic. There was just smoke everywhere. There was spot fires everywhere. You couldn't breathe, it was dark. Then through the devastation, hope appeared. And I fell on my knees because the fire had come to our door. And then I looked and I saw how it burned the entire mountain all the way down to our fence and stopped. And I just sobbed and sobbed 
and I said, Lord, I'm going to use this property for you. I can give it even more to you. Whatever you want to do, your will be done. As promised, Brenda and her husband opened their home to whomever needed help and gave an encouraging word to victims of the fire. But it didn't stop there. This fire, this tragedy has caused me to no longer be quiet about my faith and about the hard times, but also the amazing miracles that God has done in my life. And God really does use things that are meant for evil and for harm, God, and for His glory. And when you're surrounded by fire, you're surrounded by circumstances, you're surrounded by evil, you don't think you can stand up, you don't think you could rise up, there's no hope in sight. God will come through for you, and God will raise you up out of the fire, and He'll make it even better and more beautiful than what you can imagine. God will come through for you. He came through for Brenda. He's no respecter of persons. If you need a miracle, if you need prayer, uh, we have something that will encourage you. Uh, this prayer sheet is called Answered Prayer, God's Power in Your Life. It's it's free. We'll send it to you. Just give us a call right now, 1-800-700-7000, or go to CBN.com to get your free copy. Serving for 29 years in multiple war zones, Kevin always put the war welfare of his soldiers first. His wife, Richa, kept the home fire burning. Then Kevin retired from the military and the couple faced a new challenge. Where were they going to get the money to pay the rent? Anytime you're in a, a war zone, there's a possibility that anything could happen. And so whatever feelings or whatever fears I might have had, I have to suppress that and make sure that I'd be strong for my soldiers. If I had to die so they can come back to their families, then I was willing to make that sacrifice. For Army Staff Sergeant Kevin, placing the warriors who served under him first was always his priority. He deployed multiple times to war zones like Bosnia, Albania, and Iraq, each time leaving behind his wife, Richa, and their children. Is that gonna be the last time I talk to him? You think about your children. Uh, you think about things that you don't want to think about. Everything has to be in order when they leave. So just in case if they don't come back. Richa relied on her faith to sustain her through the multiple separations that ranged between six months to a year. Prayer, it helped me stay grounded. It helped me not to worry. It helped me to have peace. After 29 years, it was time for Kevin to retire. The couple felt God was calling them to start and pastor their own church, but they had to get through some financial hurdles first. After leaving the Army, paying rent was a challenge since they no longer had free military housing. Then both of their vehicles needed major repairs, totaling several thousand dollars. Where's the money going to come from? What if we don't have enough? Um, you know, all those different things. Despite the challenges, Kevin felt God would provide. My faith in God and His Word has helped me to stay calm and to keep my sanity. And so for me, it is everything. I believe I'm able to sit here and smile and, and not worry, because I believe that God is going to get us through this. The couple confided in their pastor, Tommy Leonard, with New Season Church in Anchorage, Alaska. He immediately contacted CBN's Helping the Homefront to ask if we could assist. When they first presented the situation to me, it was a bit overwhelming. I knew this was something that, as a church, we couldn't just write a check for. But to be able to have a resource like Helping the Homefront, it's a dream come true. Pastor Tommy sat down with the couple to share some big news. New Season Christian Center, in partnership with CBN, want to help with some of the pressures that you're feeling right now in your transition. And so we're going to take care of first two months of your rent. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we don't want you just to get to a point of getting things done. We want you to get ahead. And then, since you have an issue with your vehicles, we're going to take your vehicles to Alaska Sales and Service, and we're going to take those and get them repaired for you today. This is overwhelming. <laughs> um, like I said, thank you. 
the Bible says God is a reward of those who diligently seek him. And this is part of his reward package for you. Their vehicles were fixed right away. CBN paid their rent for two months. And Kevin and Reach's dream came true. They now pastor their own church in Anchorage. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude, thanking God for New Season Christian Center as well as CBN. It changes a lot. <laughs> right now, it does. Thank you, CBN. Yes. Right. It's worth trusting and believing God. Yeah. I'm so thankful to God for this blessing today. Our military families are so deserving. I love seeing their faces when they're getting blessed like that. And, you know, if you're a CBN partner, a part of your gift goes to helping the home front and blessing our military families. And uh, boy, they've done so much for us. It's, it's the least we can do. If you would like to join the 700 Club, I'd like to invite you to go to your phones right now or go on to CBN.com and just say, yes, I, I want to be a part of helping people all over the world and right here at home. It's so easy. It's just $20 a month. 65 cents a day is all it takes to become a CBM partner. When you join, be sure to ask for Pledge Express. It's uh, where your bank does all the work, no stamps, no checks, no hassle, and it comes right out of your checking account. I, I have that, and it's, it's fantastic, and you will love it. So, uh, again, 1-800-700-7000 uh, is the number to call, or you can go on to CBN.com, or you can text CBN to 71777, easy number to remember to just help hurting people all over the world and our wonderful military families. Well, it's been fun being with you uh, and being on the, with you all week long. And we leave you with these words from Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. One of my favorite scriptures. Thank you so much for watching today. God bless you and have a wonderful weekend.